they're a, a minority group there, about a third of a million uh, of them, and there's only about 30 Christians, period, amongst them, full stop, amongst them. And there's only one Seventh-day Adventist that we know of. So our mission is to go there and to, by God's grace, establish the Seventh-day Adventist church amongst these people. So before we dive on into the sermon, I'm just going to, going to ask uh, the guy there at the back just to play a short little um, video on what Adventist Frontier Missions, that's the, the organization we're going with, what they're all about. So if we could play that right now. Started in 1985, Adventist Frontier Missions began with a specific purpose in mind. Our unique approach to missions targets people groups with no Adventist presence, isolated by cultural, linguistic, economic, and racial barriers. Our missionaries enter these people groups, learn the language and culture, and begin raising up a body of believers. Instead of planting one church and moving on, we want to ensure that our people groups are enabled to evangelize their friends and neighbors. An AFM project is complete when not one church has been planted, but rather when a mother church has planted a daughter church, which then in turn has planted at least one granddaughter church. Instead of a single church, AFM establishes vibrant gospel movements that continue to spread throughout the entire people group even after our missionaries leave. Take, for example, the Alangan in the Philippines. Before AFM began work among this tribe, they were completely cut off from the gospel. Years of hatred and animosity between Filipinos and the Alangan isolated them from the gospel. Tim and Don Holbrook worked among the Alangan using a help ministry combined with friendship evangelism. The Lord is blessed in a mighty way. We have uh, five churches uh, established, uh, each one led by, uh, we have a total of 13 ordained uh, lay pastors, and uh, they're reaching out, they're giving Bible studies in several other villages. I think shortly we'll see probably two more churches planted there. And we, we see it, we've influenced the entire people group. Not everyone is, has chosen Christianity but we've definitely influenced their lives. They have embraced Christianity, and what that has meant to them is that they have lost their fear. These people were, are very timid by nature, and everything they know about their, their religion is animist, and everything about animism makes them afraid. And so you would see them everywhere they would walk, they'd look up at you from under their, their um, fearful worried eyebrows and now they look at you with a big smile on their face and no worry lines and they understand that there really is a power that's stronger and that loves them. Uh, 
With over 150 baptized members, this gospel movement will continue to spread back up into the mountains until the entire Alangan people group have heard the good news of Jesus' love. This gospel movement will continue to spread to the rest of the tribe. Thank you. Uh, if you would like to somehow uh, get involved in a project like uh, with AF, uh, Adventist Frontier Missions, uh, we can certainly give you ways you can uh, get involved. If you would like to get involved in our project, we are um, people, uh, this is not supported by the tithe dollar from the conference. This is a, this is a, um, a lay sponsored uh, ministry. So if you have a burden to get involved in reaching, making a difference on the other side of the world or even closer to home by reaching unreached people groups, get in touch with us and we can, we can help you with that. But let's, before we uh, start, let's have another word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you now that we can turn to your word. Thank you, Father, that, Lord, you love us, that you have a message for us today. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit would draw close. And Father, may Jesus be uplifted. And uh, may these not be my words, Father, but your words. We ask these things and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sven and Hulder were a Scandinavian couple. They were Christians, Seventh-day Adventists. And these guys were the perfect Adventist couple. They sang in the choir. They went to Sabbath school every Sabbath. They went to prayer meeting at every, uh, every week. At every meal, they said their blessing, said grace. And they went to all the church functions, just the ideal young Adventist family. But there was one problem. They could not get along. So at home, they would uh, bicker, they would fuss, complain. And uh, one morning, after both of them had had devotions, separately, of course, Hulda said to Sven, she said, you know, Sven, I've been thinking. I got the answer to this hopeless problem we're living with. I think we should pray for the Lord to let one of us sleep till he comes again. And then, Sven, I could go live with my sister. Sven and Hulda, happy marriage or a not so happy marriage. And we kind of laugh at that. But you know, the Bible talks about a happy marriage or a not so happy marriage in Romans chapter 7. And I invite you to take your Bibles. I hope you brought them this morning. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 7. And I want you to take a look at verse 1. Romans 7 and verse 1. And I really want us to look at this passage this morning. And I want you to, uh, I want you to help me here figure out what the Apostle Paul is talking about. You're familiar along with me that sometimes what Paul says can be kind of confusing. So we're going to try and uh, see what he's saying here. But Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? Verse 2. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. Now, what's Paul talking about here? He's talking about what law? The law of marriage, right? Paul here is saying that as long as two people are married, that they are bound by the law of marriage to stay together. And the only thing that can dissolve that union is what? according to, to Paul here in Romans, is death, all right, death. Now, now what laws he, is he referring to? He's referring to the one in 1 Corinthians. And just, just flip over there just quickly with me. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. Uh, not that we really need to. But 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, this is what Paul's referring to. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. 
It says a wife is bound by law as long as her husband, what? Lives. But if her husband does what? Dies, she is at liberty to be married to whomever she wishes, only in the Lord. So Paul is referring to this law here. Now, he chooses not to, to, folk, to bring up that exception that Jesus brought up about the fornication. We understand that about adultery. He's just saying the law, the general law is that when you're married, you're bound to the law of marriage to each other, and the only thing that can dissolve that union is what? Is the death of one of the, one of the spouses. Okay, let's go back to verse 3 now. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called and what? Adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. So what, what does Paul go on here and say? He's saying that if somebody in that union decides to go after another woman or another man, they become a what? They become a what? An adulteress. That's right. They become guilty of adultery. It's just kind of simple here, Bible arithmetic, okay? You've got a husband and a wife. If somebody who's married leaves that and plays around, they are considered an adulteress. All right. So the only way that she can legally remarry is if one of them dies. Now, what in the world does this have to do with us, you're thinking? What in the world does this have to do with me today here in Wangarei? Well, I want you to take a look now at verse 4, because Paul kind of brings it home now. Verse 4. Romans 7, verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So what, what's Paul doing here? Paul is saying, whoops, is this on? Can you hear me now? Hear me over the mic? Okay, all right. Sometimes I find it hard to kind of stand still. Paul, what Paul is saying here is that Paul is talking about every single Christian or every person. He's saying that he's, he's bringing out that he's not really talking here about literal marriage. He's talking about a spiritual experience that you and I are in, a spiritual situation. Now, if that's the case, then who is the woman in this, in this analogy? Paul here in this, those verses we just read is using this as an analogy. So who would the woman, okay who's bound to, the, to, to, to her husband by law, who does she represent? In the Bible, a woman represents the church. So we could say here that this woman represents you and me. All right? You and me. Now let me ask you this. Who's the former husband that we're married to? Look very closely at, this, at those texts. Who is the the husband that we're married to. The old husband. It's us as well. It's the old man of the selfish nature. That's what Paul is talking about here. In other words, Paul is saying it's like we've got two people living inside of us. We've got an old man and we've got our will. All right? And naturally, we are bound... By law, you could say, law of, of nature to our old man. So did you know that you have an old man living inside of you? Anybody? Uh, and some of you women, you have an old lady living inside of you too. All right? I don't care who you are, we have an old somebody living inside of us. And what Paul is saying here is that we are legally bound to that sinful nature and that union, if we try to get away from it, we are guilty of spiritual adultery. You say, what is he going on about here? Well, I think it's going to become clear here. When you understand, I want you to, uh, to look now again at verse 4. Look at verse 4. 
Actually, look at verse 3. It says, So then if while her husband, if our wills are bound to the old man, if we try and marry another, we would be guilty of adultery. But if the husband dies, we can be free. So if we are bound to our old sinful natures, the old man or the old woman, what is the only way we can legally be married to another? Something, somebody has to die, right? The only way we can legally be remarried to another, leave that old man or that old woman and be remarried to another is if something dies or someone dies. And in this case, the old man has to die. So Paul is using this illustration of marriage to bring out the spiritual truth that our sinful natures must die if we want to have a relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? Anybody? Does it make sense? I want this to be very clear. Because you know what's happening today with a lot of Christians? A lot of Christians are still married to this old sinful nature or this old man or the old woman, okay, while trying to be married to Jesus, trying to be living the Christian life. And so it's like they have their foot in this marriage, they're still bound to this old sinful nature while wanting to have this foot in this marriage, being married to Jesus. And they're stuck between these two relationships, all right? And the Bible really says that that's impossible. It's impossible. We've either got to be totally in this relationship or totally in this relationship with Jesus. So Paul is saying here that if we want to be free from that old man, the old man has to die. Okay. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law. You've allowed that old sinful man to die, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to, to God. So if we allow this old sinful nature to die, who then can we be married to? Jesus. Jesus. Our wills can be married to, to Jesus. You know, um, folks, God is too noble to allow us to be in two relationships at the one time. God is too noble to play second fiddle to our sinful nature. We've got to come to the point where we say, you know what? I want to be out of this old marriage relationship, this old sinful nature, this this. This, having this allegiance to my sinful nature. We have to come to the point where we say, you know, I want to give that up and go all the way with Jesus in order for us truly to have the experience he wants us. That's really what, what Paul is saying here. Um, look at Revelation chapter 3 in verse 15 and 16. Revelation chapter 3 verses 15 and 16. Revelation 3, verses 15 and 16. John says here, actually Jesus is saying here, through John, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Basically what it's describing here is somebody, a Christian, who still wants to keep one foot in the world while having one foot in Jesus or in the church. And they end up sitting right there on the fence. It's this lukewarm. It's a person that's still holding on to this old marriage relationship to the old sinful nature while still wanting to have to be married to Jesus. That's what it's saying there in Revelation uh, chapter 3. Now, let's go back to Romans. What do most marriages, what comes from most marriages, not all marriages, but what do most marriages produce? The average marriage. Children, right? Children. Now go back to Romans chapter 7. And, uh, and Paul continues this analogy. And notice what he says here. 
Romans chapter 7 and verse, again, verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to marry to Jesus, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should do what? Bear fruit to who? To God. What he's saying here is that we can choose to get out of this old marriage and become part of this new spiritual marriage with Jesus. And if we do, we're going to produce some fruit. We're going to have a baby, all right, you could say, out of this new marriage. That's what he's saying here. This is kind of baby language, bearing fruit, all right? So we can bear fruit if we just choose to enter this new relationship with Jesus. Now, if you turn to Galatians chapter 5, you can turn there, but Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23 will tell you what kind of offspring will come when we link up with Jesus, when we enter into a relationship with Jesus. Galatians chapter 5, and verses 22 and 23. This is what will be produced from this new, new marriage. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit... Is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. So, if you want to have that kind of fruit in your life, then we, we, you have to make the decision. I have to make the decision to let this old affinity to the old man go and enter this relationship with Jesus. Amen? That's, that's the only way. If you want true, lasting love, joy, and peace. Let this old man go. By the way, this old man's a real grouch to live with. Have you noticed that? I know my old man living inside. I, mean, I don't want to be married to him. He's a, he's a jerk. He's selfish. And uh, I want to be married to, to a new man, to Jesus. I want to let this old man go. Um, you know, it, it gives here... In verse 5, the fruit of, of what will happen if we stick with this old relationship. Look at verse 5. So when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit. Again, this is what will come from that old relationship. will bear fruit to what? Death. So the Bible is saying that if we stick with this old man, if our will stays with this old nature, the result will be death. So we've got two options here. Do you want death or do you want life? I think each of us wants life, amen? We just need to be willing to say, you know, old man, I'm going to surrender you to the grave so I can be married to Jesus. You know, it reminds, it always pays to know what kind of fruit will come from a relationship. You know that? When my wife and I had our first child, rushed her to the hospital, we are all excited, and about 15 hours after we arrived in the hospital, uh, this baby comes along. And I remember Hannah, her head comes out, and it looked huge, huge. And I thought, shivers, what in the world have we produced here? And, uh, you know, most parents are kind of nervous. They want to make sure their child is, is healthy. And I thought, oh, boy, something's wrong. And, and uh, then the, uh, the doctor put his hand, like, right on her face. And I thought, oh, man, I know something's wrong. He's trying to hide, hide it from me. And, uh, of course, when she came out, she was just beautiful, right? Just absolutely perfect. At least I thought so. But it pays to check what kind of fruit will come from a relationship. And Paul is saying here, listen, you need to, you need to, to see what's going to happen in your life if you stay with this old man of sin. And, you, and I want you to see what's going to happen if you, if you marry another one, if you, if you give your life to Jesus. Amen? Make sense? All right, amen. Let's press on here. So there are several things Paul is getting at here. Naturally, each of us is in bondage to our sinful nature. Is that clear? It's clear. It's called the old man. All right, everybody, before they meet Jesus, is in bondage to this person. If they like it or not, they're slaves. Okay? Number two, if we want to be free from this relationship, legally, we have to let that sinful nature die. Surrender it to Jesus. Okay? And number three, if we do, Jesus will give us new life in return. Amen? That's the exciting thing. What we're talking about today is surrender. 
surrender. If you're, are you tired of your old life today? Of the old sinful nature, selfish nature, keeping you bound? I know I am. Do you want a new life? Then God is saying that we must be willing to surrender that old sinful nature to Jesus. And say, you know what, Jesus? I'm gonna, I just want to surrender this old life to you. And ask Jesus to give me that new life. Now let me ask you a question. That old man, when he dies there in the grave, by the way, that's what Paul is talking about when he's saying, I die daily. Did you know that? You know when Paul says, I die daily, or you know, I'm crucified with Christ, he's not talking about the physical body. He's talking about that old nature, that selfish nature. He knew he had to go to that grave every morning in order for him to live the life Jesus wanted for him to live. That's what Paul was talking about there. You know, Jesus emphasized the same truth. Turn to John chapter 12 with me, just quickly. John chapter 12 and verse 24. John chapter 12 and verse, verse 24. John 12, verse 24 and 25. John 12, 24 and 25. Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains what? What does it say? It remains alone. But if it dies, it produces what? Much grain. Jesus, what are you talking about? He goes on and explains, He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for life everlasting. Jesus was saying the same principle here, that in order for new life to take to take root and flourish, there has to be death first. And in this case, it's the death of the old life, the old life of sin, in order for this to happen. Our life is like a grain of sand, not a grain of sand, that wouldn't go anywhere, would it? It's like a grain of uh, seed, like a grain of wheat, all right? It can't produce fruit unless it falls to the ground first, and dies. But if it dies in the ground, it will produce much fruit. I'm reminded of the giant sequoia trees in California. Anybody been to California? Several of you. Anybody been to the giant sequoia trees? Several of you. All right. You know what these trees are like? They just shoot up to the, to the, to the sky. And an interesting thing about these trees is they have a cone that is very hard. There are only two things that can break into these cones. One is a squirrel, squirrel with very sharp teeth, all right? They can gnaw into to them. The other thing is a forest fire. And these forest fires that they have in California just, just fly through the vegetation, and they, they engulf those sequoia trees, and the intense heat causes those cones to, to, to split open, and the seeds fall out, and they drop to the ground where, where they shoot up in new life. And you know, it's almost like those sequoia trees have to die in order for there to be new life. And that's what Jesus was getting at here. That just like they have to die, you and I have to come to that point of saying, Jesus, I want to go all the way with you. Let this old life down. Lay it down so I can go all the way with you. I want to suggest to you this morning that many of us Christians fight our battles on the wrong front. You know what we do? Is this on or not? Is this on? Can you hear me? Is this working? All right, all right. You know what most Christians do? A lot of Christians? They'll be faced with this, with this problem, all right? Say it's, uh, let's just pick one out of the sky. Uh, let's just say it's smoking, all right? And we have lots of other problems. I know I have problems, you have problems. But let's just say this one, smoking. And what most Christians will do is they'll say, okay, if I can just get, work up enough willpower to, to not pick up their next cigarette, I can conquer this thing. And so they'll begin to try and whip up as much willpower as they can, only to find that it's not enough, and they fall flat on their face every time. Have you been there? I've been in a, I've been in a place, that place. I believe that that's fighting the battle on the wrong front. When we understand that as Christians, the, the, the key point is surrendering to Jesus every day in the morning, laying that old nature down. 
You know what we can do when that cigarette comes floating by? We can say, you know what, praise God. I don't have to work up willpower to overcome that thing because that old nature is dead already. It's dead. And so, and so now because that old nature is dead, this, is no long, this no longer has power over me. You see the difference? One is coming at the temptation from, a, from a, an inner focus of what I can do. The other one is realizing that reality in Jesus, that that old man, he has taken the power out of that old man. And now we no longer have to be bound. Amen? So next time you see something that maybe you're not supposed to look at, or next time you, you're struggling with something, you know what you should say? Instead of saying, oh man, I, I hope I can have enough power to get over this thing. Say, God, praise you. My old man is dead. Thank you, Lord. I no longer am bound to this thing. I no longer have to be bound. And as you claim that by faith, sure there's a struggle. But it's at that point, rather than trying to whip up enough willpower. Does that make sense? You know, I, I believe that God wants to give us a powerful experience in our lives when we understand what he's done in here by faith. Praise God for that. Listen to this. This is from Ellen White. Powerful passage here. Why is it so hard to live a self-denying, humble life? Because professed Christians are not dead to the world. It's, I, I, I love this point. It's easy living after we are dead. Don't you like that? She says, why, why are we as Christians so, so uh, prone to, to trip up? Why is it so hard to live the Christian life? It's because we're not dead to the world. We're not willing to, to let go of the world and embrace Jesus. That's really the, the bottom line. But it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to let go of the world. It's really hard. Um, I remember down at Longburn, I have several people here who are at Longburn. Um, uh, I think it was my last year, um, there was kind of like a, a, a revival that went across campus. And um, uh, Arthur Yeo had a dream, I think, and uh, just really felt impressed that, you know, the, the college needed to really start to get real serious again. And anyway, um, there, was, uh, there was quite a movement across campus. And I remember, I remember holding off and saying, you know what, I've tried to be a Christian before, and it's never worked. And... Um, Anyway, but one particular day, I was walking back into the boys' dorm, and I walked into the, uh, to the dorm there, and it was where Tony Smith uh, used to room, uh, Andrew and Shane. And uh, this was, the, I think, the following year, so John was there. And uh, there was uh, several guys there sitting on, uh, kneeling, actually, on the, on, on the floor of, of the room. And they invited me to come in, and they said, um, um, listen, Greg, why don't you pray with us? And, uh, and I said, yeah, no, nah, you know, I really don't, don't want to. And uh, they persisted. And they said, no, come on, why don't you just pray? Get, get on your knees and pray. And, uh, you know, praise God for persistent friends, right? Um, so I said, okay. So I got down on my knees. And, um, and uh, something, you know, this Holy Spirit had kind of connected the dots. And I knew that right there was my moment to decide. Was I going to go all the way with Jesus or not? And I remember the struggle. Man, it was a struggle. Just to say, you know, Jesus, yeah, I'm going to give my life to you, totally to you. And I remember that, you know, the tears began to come down my cheeks. And, um, and I, I did for the first time. And I, I surrendered to Jesus. And I trusted him as my personal savior. And you know what happened? I got up off that floor. And it was like a ton of bricks had just gone, whoop, right off my shoulders. Just gone. And I discovered this truth, that truly new life comes when we're willing to totally lay down that old life. I just praise God for that, you know. He's such a, a powerful, awesome, awesome father. Just, just, uh, uh, just a couple more stories here before we, uh, before we wrap up. Um, I was, I've been pastoring in, in the United States. And one time I was visiting a, a, a lady. She hadn't been coming to church. So I went to visit her and I said, you know, how's, how are things going? How, how are things going in your spiritual life? Kind of a straight question. 
Um, but, you know, I've discovered that if you beat around the bush too much, you know, nobody knows what you're talking about. So you might as well just go straight, right, to the heart. So I said, how are things going? And she said, well, um, you know, I, I've been struggling. And uh, I said, oh, really? Yeah, she said, you know, I've been addicted to novels, to novels. You know, you know some of us guys, uh, we have problems with, you know, lewd pictures and whatnot. You know what I'm talking about. Some of the women get addicted to novels, romance novels. And she was addicted to this stuff. And she said, but you know what? She said, I've given it up. I said, well, awesome. That's, that's fantastic. I said, is there, is there anything else, you know, that you're struggling with? And she said, yeah, she said, there is. She said, see that black box there in the corner of the room? <laughs> I said, yeah, okay. She said, yeah, she said, I'm struggling with that. And uh, I said, oh, really? You know, I'm not saying that it's bad to have a black box in the corner of your room, you know. It's what comes through it. That can be the trouble, right? You know, praise God for 3ABN, right? Um, she said, yeah, I've been struggling with that. I said, oh, really? She said, yeah. And I said, you know, um, do you feel it's coming between you and the Lord? And she said, yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. Was, was the real problem that TV? No, the, the real problem wasn't that TV. That's just an electrical circuit box sitting in the corner. The real problem was that, that it was, she knew that it was standing between her and Jesus, and she wasn't willing to let it go. So I said, you know, is there anything that would prevent you from just turning that over to Jesus? You know what happened? The funniest thing happened. Nothing. For about three or four minutes, it was silence. Silence. And I could tell she was struggling. She was just wrestling. And I was just praying. And um, about three or four minutes after, she went like this. <sighs> she says, you know what? There's nothing preventing me from turning that over to Jesus. And I said, would you like to do that just, just now? Just, t- just turn it over to Him. And she said, yeah. And she, we, we knelt there and prayed. And, and she made the decision that it wasn't worth holding on to that thing to prevent her being, going all the way with Jesus. And she surrendered it. And you know what happened after that? She started to come to church. Uh, one day she called me up and she said, you know, Pastor, she said, um, you know what, I haven't been paying tithe. But I feel convicted that I should start paying tithe. And so she began to start paying tithe. And I never touched the subject with her. So, you know, God can do those kind of things, can't he? Um, but her issue was surrender. That's what we're talking about. Are we willing to let go of those old things, the old life, the sinful nature, in embracing Jesus all the way? You know, I have been impressed with a young lady from, um, from the States uh, who went through a very traumatic experience. Several years ago, two gunmen made their way into the Columbine High School and began to randomly shoot and gun down their, their peers. And one particular, one particular uh, classroom they went into was this young lady's classroom. And the guys busted in there, and they said, Okay, is anybody in here a Christian? And young Casey Barnell stood up, and she said, Yes. She said, I am. Only to be gunned down almost point-blank range, dead on the ground. What really impressed me was, was a poem that she wrote just a couple of, I believe, days before she was, she was gunned down. Listen to this. And by the way, several months before this, she had been involved in the occult. She'd, she'd given that up, given her life to Jesus. And she wrote this. She penned these words just a few days before she was gunned down. She said, Now I have given up on everything else. I have found it to be the only way to really know Christ and to experience the mighty power that brought him back to life again and to find out what it means to suffer and to die with him. So whatever it takes, I will be one who lives in the fresh newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. Powerful, prophetic words from Casey Barnell. She says, 
I really, I've, I've given up on everything else. If I can know what it means to experience Jesus in His fullness, I'll be willing to give it up. And to understand the might and experience the mighty power that brought Him back to life again. And to find out what it means to suffer for Him. So whatever it takes, and she didn't know that in two days it would take her very life, her physical life, to experience the newness of life of those who are alive from the dead. And now that goes down as testimony to you and me about what Jesus can do in a life if we just surrender to Him. You know, um, how's it with you? Is there anything that's standing between you and Jesus? Have you come to the point where you've given up that old man, the old sinful nature? And by the way, let me say this. You know, that old sinful nature has an uncanny way of rearing his ugly head again. You know that? He's got to die every day. <laughs> and he won't totally die until Jesus comes again and just takes away our sinful nature, period. Right? We'll still have a fight with this old man. But have you come to the point where you have, where you have assigned him to the grave? Or is there something standing between you and, and Jesus? I just want to invite you just to uh, make the decision now. To say, Jesus, you know what? It's not worth, it's not worth it. Because, uh, because I do want to experience life and joy and peace. I don't want to reap death. And if that's your decision today, I invite you just to make that decision and tell Jesus about it. And he'll take you all the way. And he'll give you a powerful, awesome life and a new life. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, today, we want to thank you for the new life that we can have in Jesus. Lord, we've seen today from Scripture that each one of us is, is naturally, legally bound to this old man, this old man of sin. And Lord, that you're too noble to, to come, come in without us allowing you and, and taking over the relationship. You're too noble to do that. But Father, you give us the power to make the decision to let that go and to embrace you. Father, today, if there's anything in our hearts that maybe you've put your finger on today, we just want to surrender that and by faith rise from that and say, I am crucified with Christ. There's no longer I who lives Excuse me, I'm crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Lord Jesus, may that be our experience today. In his name we pray. Amen.